Good morning. My name is Arthur Skorek, and I'm an executive secretary at the European Association of Israel Studies. And this is the next episode of our series of discussions about Israel studies um, with, uh, with the scholars studying the Israel and giving it a new, fresh perspective uh, dealing with Israel. And this is the sixth episode, and we are very happy to have with us Professor Johannes Becker. Hello, good morning. Good morning. And I want to warmly welcome you and also warmly welcome all of our viewers, uh, especially subscribers of our YouTube channel. And please let me give a short bio, a concise description of your biog academic biography. Uh, so, Professor Johannes Becker, he obtained his PhD from Freie Universität Berlin, and now he is a professor of Israel and Middle East studies at the Heidelberg Center for Jewish Studies. And he's also engaged in the joint program of the Heidelberg Center for the Jewish Studies and the Heidelberg University that integrates the study of Zionism and, and Israel uh, within the study of, of Middle East. Before his appointment in Heidelberg, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Oxford, and he was a visiting fellow also in Tel Aviv University, in the Orient Institute in Beirut, the center Jacques Berg in Rabat. And uh, currently he's also leading a research group uh, and the research project is titled Gathering the Dispersed, the State Evasion and the State Making in Modern Jewish, Kurdish and Berber History at the Karl Jasper Center for Advanced Transcultural Studies of Heidelberg University. And I would say it's a follow up of this comparative perspective uh, that he's um, having in his book that we will discuss now. So the last book of Pro Professor Johannes Becker is the book titled Land Beyond the Border, State Formation and Territorial Expansion in Syria, Morocco and Israel. And obviously we will focus on the Israel case study, but for sure uh, Professor Becker will give us the broader perspective, a comparative uh, perspective. He's also a co-editor of uh, the book in German, Israel Studies, the History, Methods and Paradigms. He's also co-organizing a research colloquium on Israel and Middle East. Um, he has also, he's co-directing the um, podcast that is called Mecca and Jerusalem, and that is dealing with uh, Muslim-Jewish relations. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm, I'm getting into your, your book. I read the book, it's, it's really interesting, and I have a couple, of, actually several questions, and probably we won't be able to deal into the details of uh, all the things that we would like to discuss, so just a few main questions. Uh, and I would like to start with a very general, even generic uh, question. So what is the background for your work on the book? Where, where did the idea for the book come from? Were there any turning points in your explorations? Yeah, first of all, many thanks for the invitation and for the opportunity to um, present my research. Um, I think the, the book um, started out of my um, disappointment with the pre-existing research literature um, on Israeli rule of the occupied territories, the occupation, the settlement project. Um, my impression was that it tends to um, overemphasize the exceptional, exceptionalism of the Israeli case, um, and it also tends to isolate the Israeli case from its mm -hmm. regional environment. Um, and so I started looking around what might be other comparable cases. I mean, all these cases are very different, um, but they usually tend to share um, this notion of a state, a contested territory, expansion and long-term military and political rule. Um, and my impression was that there is a number of Middle Eastern cases um, that at least deserve a closer focus and maybe a comparison. Um, and so I essentially picked uh, Morocco, Western Sahara and Syria and Lebanon, which was a great chance to travel um, and to actually visit these places. Um, which I can highly recommend. Um, and I think th throughout this process of writing this book, um, it made me think a bit also about this research field of Israel studies um, and its isolation from the field of Middle East studies, which I believe is something we will still be discussing here. Yeah, yeah it's, it's one of the most interesting things about the book, and I, and I want to delve into um, 
this concept because yes you are putting israel in this framework of post-colonial studies and you suggest that there are more traits of the arab partners of israel than the western states to the policies uh, of the of the Jewish state. So, can you elaborate how how did it happen that the project that was designed and, and created by the Jews of Europe, uh, modernized uh, Western Jews, uh, end up as a Middle Eastern polity? Was it a result of the hostile international environments so or the other states socializing Israel to be more more Middle Eastern, or was it the, the Jewish Oriental population, the Mizrahim, that came to Israel early? Or some other factors at play? I think there's a number of factors, um, both demographic, cultural, um, but also political or maybe even institutional. Um, first of all, the majority of Israel's population um, really has no deep connection, no deep migratory connection to Europe, right? So it's Middle Eastern Jews um, and Palestinian Arabs. Um, and actually, if you look at Israeli population, kind of the Ashkenazi, formerly European Jews, are a minority of the population. Um, if you look at Israel from um, a perspective of historical institutions, um, I think there's a huge difference between European Jewish thinkers of Zionism, right, in the late 19th century, and what actually happened on the ground. Um, because this, this society and, and this new state, it's not being built in Odessa or in Warsaw or in Berlin, it's being built in the Middle East. Um, and from the beginning, I mean, for these early waves of settlers or pioneers or immigrants, you have this close encounter with the Palestinian Arab majority, um, first with kind of the Ottoman Empire, then with the British Empire. So if you look at the institutional legacies of Israeli state building, you have kind of this Ottoman legacy. So, for instance, religious family law, um, kind of the chief rabbinate. Um, and then you have this British legacy of having colonial rule over this territory. Um, until today, Israel is applying all kinds of British laws, including emergency regulations. Um, and even if you look at the timing of Israeli statehood, it, it emerges like many other post-colonial states after World War II um, throughout this period of decolonization. Um, so in a way, it's, it's a new state emerging from an imperial Ottoman context, from a colonial British context, um, and therefore, I believe it, it makes a lot of sense to look at Israel um, within the time frame of similar states. Yeah? Just think of the partition of India, yeah? which actually creates two states, um, which always was the role model for the partition of Palestine, where only one state was being created. Um, so Israel is not, not very different from other states that emerged from such a colonial setting. And it's not the only post-colonial state which then engages in such an expansionist project. Right. And as we are dealing with the discipline of post-colonial studies, uh, let me start from this pre-Israel period and the mandate of Palestine, the British mandate of Palestine. And uh, you wrote in your book about the failed attempts of the British to, to found the new state that would be the uh, state of Jews and Arabs, the composite Arab Jewish state. And how does it uh, play with the other narrative that is there in uh, other historians' books about the divide and rule policy of the Great Britain that tried to, well, to appeal to both of the populations, but at the same time antagonize them so there won't be uh, one joint for anti-colonial forces of Jews and Arabs. Perhaps it, it sounds as a political fiction, but there were, for example, the communist uh, forces that probably would join in in this program of the common Jews and Arab spies. So how is it? Yeah, um, I think in the Israeli-Palestinian case, um, this divide and rule logic is less relevant. Um, I think the essentially the failure of the British policy um, in mandatory Palestine has a lot to do with promising too many different things to too many people at the same time, right? The British supported both the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire, and then you have the Balfour Declaration, and those two things couldn't really be combined in mandatory Palestine. There are some attempts to bridge this gap and actually build this Arab-Jewish binational state, but it doesn't really work on the ground. 
Um, divide and rule is more relevant, I think, in my two other case studies. Um, so if you look at Syria, which was divided into five separate statelets at uh, some point, if you look at Morocco, where the Berber policy um, attempted to build kind of two ethno-territorial entities under French control, here divide and rule is more relevant. Um, but I think in the British case of mandatory Palestine, early on, um, this attempt to merge these two national movements um, under one umbrella falls apart, um, at least in the 1920s um, and especially 1929. Okay, so you would claim that the, the British, they uh, really believed in this binational states at the beginning of the process in the 20s, when they were saying about the Jewish national homeland on the one hand, and then the sovereign state of the Arabs on the other hand. They were believing that it's possible to merge this yeah. to ethnos. It's hard to tell. Um, if you look at British policy, um, it, it changes quite a bit, right? So every time there is a new development on the ground, you have a new white paper. Um, and then you have um, this idea of a national Jewish home. Nobody knows what that actually means. They say, well, it's definitely not to say that Palestine will become as Jewish as um, England is English. Um, so the British have conflicting geopolitical goals, right? They want to keep the region under their control. Um, they want to control the pathway to India. Um, they, well, after the Balfour Declaration, they kind of had a certain commitment um, towards the Zionist project. Um, and at some point, this all falls apart. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced there was a, a, a clearly de delineated British policy um, to begin with. Um, and I think it's days like this until the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's get to the uh, new fledgling state of Israel in the 50s, in the early 60s. Uh, and you write about some tensions, the eternal tensions, and I would like to uh, get into the details of this uh, intra-Jewish conflicts within the Israel that might have undermined uh, its legit legitimacy, the legitimacy of the state. You write about the, the threat of the military coup that was perhaps in the head of David Ben-Gurion, or that was his uh, fear that it will happen, or the heroic opposition to negotiations with West Germany, or maybe the ultra-Orthodox Jewry getting into more radical anti-Zionist stance. How, how strong was the threat that the Jewish polity will implode because of these tensions, internal tensions? Well, I mean, looking back, it looks quite stable, right? You have this Altalena incident in which kind of hegemony of the IDF over right-wing militias um, gets implemented simply um, based on well, threats of military attack, right? Um, however, if you look um, at the way the state of Israel, um, or let, let's put it more bluntly, the Mapai establishment, look at their political competition, um, you get the impression that maybe this was less stable than we think. Um, first of all, the Palestinian Arab minority, so those people who actually stayed, um, they're under a form of military administration, right? So censorship, restrictions of movement, um, very close control in terms of politics. Um, if you look at the left-wing opposition and the right-wing opposition, you have this huge network of surveillance, not just of a few left-wing generals, um, but also of the Chavot movement. Um, and this even extends to smaller movements. Yeah? If you think of um, the New Hebrews or the Canaanites, the small political sect or cult, which counts maybe less than 100 members, you have ongoing surveillance um, of its members simply because they declare themselves to be anti-Zionists. And somehow Ben Goyon thinks they might become a threat um, for the newly established Jewish state. Um, so I think this high level of surveillance over the ethnic minority and the political competition tells you something about at least the perceived instability of this newly fledged state. Okay, and, and, and this gets us to uh, another issue that you're writing about. Uh, well, the, the core of your research, so the state expansions, and you try to explain the state expansions in Israel, but also in the two other case studies uh, that you've mentioned as the answer, as a reply to this uh, crisis of legitimacy or the sovereignty uh, of the state. So per probably this perception of Mapai establishment uh, can be treated as this uh, crisis of uh, legitimacy. 
So you say that the state expansion actually is a reestablishment of the state. So the answer to this crisis. But we see that the, the greater Israel movement it gains momentum in the 70s and then in the 80s. Well, the, the circles that probably in, enjoyed to entertain this um, greater Israel vision were there before. But the, the mass movement for the greater Israel and these hundreds of thousands as its enthusiasts that supported Gush Emunim, this is something of the 70s and the 80s. So why do you think it gained momentum then when Israel's position internationally is strengthened after the Six-Day War? Yeah, um, first of all, I think we shouldn't underestimate um, the shock impact of the near defeat in the Yom Kippur War, right? Mm -hmm. And in a way, Gush Emunim is a response um, to this perception of at least near defeat um, and of Syrian tanks coming relatively close to Israeli population centers. Um, the 70s is also, of course, um, the decade in which you have the Mahapach, right? So the first time, 1977, you have um, a coalition of the marginalized taking over. You have right-wing, secular, sometimes Ashkenazi-led political parties um, that are voted into office by Middle Eastern Jewish Israelis, right? So the Mizrahim, vote for Begin, and then you have the Mahapach. Um, and I would argue that this coalition of the marginalized, um, so right-wing secularists, left-wing maximalists, um, the national right, which then becomes somewhat messianic, um, and sometimes even the ultra-orthodox, is being held together by this shared appeal um, of greater Israel for very different reasons, right? For some, it's security, for some, it's ultra-nationalism, for some, it's messianism and even religious meaning of coming back um, to the ancestral biblical homeland. Um, but in a way, this new coalition really is rebuilding the state of Israel in terms of economics, in terms of politics, in terms of rediscovering kind of the Jewish diasporic and religious legacy. Um, and this rebuilding of the state also works because Israel won in the Six Day War, right? So from now on, Israel actually is an attractive geopolitical player in the region. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's where the whole US-Israeli alliance really stems from. Um, Israel can build kind of a cold peace um, with Egypt based on returning the Sinai Peninsula. Um, Israel turns into kind of this projection screen or this new um, interesting way of looking at the world, both for the American Jewish diaspora, but also for evangelicals. So there's new alliances being created. Um, or, of course, all of this is very much at the expense of the Palestinians living under occupation. Um, but for a few decades, you really have the impression that there is a new Israeli society being built. Yeah? So in a Gramscian way, you can say, well, this is a new hegemonic project. This is a new state project. Um, and, and I would argue this has a lot to do with rebuilding the state after the Six-Day War and also rebuilding the state around the control over the occupied territories. Right, and, and continuing with the with the occupied territories, um, there, there is a suggestion of Ilan Pape, the controversial historian, who say the enfant terrible of, of the Israeli historians, uh, that after the first Arab Jewish war, the war of independence from the perspective of Israel, the Israeli po military political establishment, it waited for the pretext to take hold uh, of the West Bank, and. Uh, it, is it something that goes along the lines of, of your research with the Zionist project, well, having just an extension uh, in Judea and Samaria? So was this internal logic of Zionists to, to go further beyond the border because it's a neo-colonial state and because generally this is the, the core of the Zionist idea to have the settlements in the Jewish land. So getting into political fiction, uh, you think that, that that was predestined for Israel or you can imagine Israel in 1949 uh, borders living until today in the Middle East? First of all, I'd be careful about this label of, of neo-colonial. Um, I think what's interesting about the comparison with other states is precisely this notion that post-colonial states can very much have expansionist projects. Um, and this is perhaps, we have to consider this as some of part of this period of decolonization. Um, and the way that Israel deals with the West Bank 
is not terribly different from the way that Indonesia, for instance, has been treating um, newly conquered territories or the way that Morocco is treating Western Sahara. Mm -hmm. um, if we think about um, this notion of inevitability, um, personally, I don't think the um, expansion is inevitable. Yeah? And if you look at Israeli maps um, from the period of state establishment until 67, you'll see that they depict Israel within its international borders. Um, so those are not irredentist maps. Um, and the same is true for my two other case studies. Yeah? If you think about Morocco, they start talking about Western Sahara at some point in the 70s. Before that, they were perfectly satisfied with Morocco within its international borders. And the same is true for Syria. Yeah? So in a way, these initial expansions almost happen by accident. Right? And once they happen, these expanding states figure out that, well, maybe we can leverage the territory and sometimes also the population which we've conquered into rebuilding um, our alliance structure, into reinventing ourselves, and then these expansions become semi-permanent. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think there is a clear line um, connecting Israel from its founding all the way to the occupation. Um, also, in the same way, that occupation doesn't have to stay permanent, if you ask me. Um, but I think we'll get to this at the end of this interview. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I I'm trying to keep it uh, along the lines of history here. So we had the colonial uh, period, then we had this insecure period for the young Israeli state, and now we are getting to the state expansion. And when you are talking, when you are writing about the state expansion, you uh, not only in Israel but also in these other uh, case studies, uh, you, write about, you write about the four types of state expansion: the patronization, settlization, exclavization, and incorporation. Could you give us a brief overview of these types? Try to keep it very brief. Um, you're a political scientist too, right? So political scientists love their two by two <laughs> matrices um, because they tend to simplify the world. Um, my idea of creating this typology was to, to point out that state expansion can look very differently on the ground. Yeah? It's not always occupation and annexation, but there's layers in between. Um, so these four types to start with patronization, um, these four types essentially depend on state strength and pre-existing institutions in the newly conquered territory. In the case of patronization, you have pre-existing state institutions and a weak expanding state. So you have a new institutional layer, the expanding state kind of turns into the new patron of this conquered polity. If you have a stronger state expanding into a territory with a long tradition of statehood, um, this new polity turns into kind of a satellite of the expanding power, right? So it's it's a lot like, um, if you excuse the comparison, if you excuse the comparison, Eastern European satellite states under Soviet rule, right? Poland was never a member of the Soviet Union, but obviously kind of a Soviet satellite. Um, then once you have a territory um, that is kind of less developed in terms of state institutions, and you have a relatively weak expanding state, you have this phenomenon of exclavization, right? So you have the projection of state power um, into smaller entities, which are connected to the state, but not fully part of it. Usually these, these are much larger than the Israeli case. So if you think of kind of this um, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, or if you think of the Armenian Republic of Artsakh, yeah? so they're exclaves, um, it's not fully Armenia, it's not fully Turkey, but of course in a close connection um, to the homeland. Um, and I think the last case, incorporation, here you have kind of a weakly established um, level of stateness, a strong expanding state, and here you have this full-scale incorporation um, in terms of population and institution. So that's the classic pattern mm -hmm. of annexation that we're familiar with. Um, and this whole typology shows us that, well, expanding states um, have a whole variety um, of institutional settings they can choose, um, sometimes depending on the resources they're willing to invest, but also depending on previous institutions which they encounter in the territory they conquer. Right, and, and at the beginning, uh, 
as I stated in the book, the, the state expansion of Israel in the West Bank and Gaza, it, it was more of an exclavization with the settlements uh, of Jews on these lands. And then with the creation of Palestinian Authority, uh, we have it enriched by the satellization of this Palestinian entity. But cannot we just, um, looking at the nowadays situation, say that it's more about the not formal but practical incorporation of the most of the West Bank, the, the Aria Sea, uh, with just the several Arab enclaves actually in the West Bank? Well, I mean, you, you get this narrative from the Palestinian side, right? That you have kind of these isolated um, enclaves surrounded by Israeli power. Um, and I think, of course, there is a huge element of change. Um, if you look at these first Jewish Israeli exclaves um, in the 60s and 70s to this very interconnected network that it is today. Mm. Um, so clearly there's a level of institutional change. Nonetheless, um, I would argue that to an extent these settlements are still, um, they're legal exclaves, yeah, so they're, they're not incorporated into Israel proper, um, they have not been annexed, um, as we witnessed last year, um, and if, even if you look at the reality on the ground, um, Jewish settlers living within these exclaves, they're not roaming through the territory, they're not entering Palestinian towns, they're moving from exclave to exclave. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I mean, th that's kind of the, the dream of the settler movement, that these territories, um, or at least the settlements, get annexed to Israel. Um, but so far, that hasn't happened. Yeah. So just from a military and from a legal perspective, these are very much still exclaves. Okay. And we are now getting to the another phase, so the state contraction. Uh, and you write about the state contraction uh, in context of this engagement from the Gaza Strip and from the few settlements in the North and West Bank in, in Samaria. And uh, once again, we are a few years uh, after the disengagement. So do you think that the contraction, uh, the state contraction of Israel essentially stopped or do you see it as a, a small pause and we will have more of the disengagements because, for example, the legitimacy and the sovereignty of Israel, uh, well, is not undermined today. We, with, we, we see that uh, on the diplomatic level, Israel is engaged more and more with different parts of the world, India, sub-Saharan states, China, Southern Africa, Southern Korea, or even the, the Arab state, as we've seen with the Abrahamic Accords. So can we uh, look for more of this engagement, state contraction ahead of us? Well, let's hope so. Um, I mean, the point about state contraction um, is trying to emphasize that for all three case studies, right, none of these states um, succeeded in making their rule over newly conquered territories permanent um, and fully legitimate in the eyes of the UN. Now, East Timor, for instance, nowadays is a state because the Indonesians had to withdraw. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's recognizing Moroccan rule of Western Sahara. Okay, the Americans are pretending to recognize it. Um, Syria had to withdraw um, from Lebanon. And if you look at Israeli expansionism, kind of from a um, long durée perspective, um, you'll see that, well, Israel has withdrawn from the Sinai Peninsula. Israel has withdrawn from South Lebanon. It has negotiated at least a withdrawal um, from the Golan Heights, it has withdrawn from the Gaza Strip. So from the height of Israeli territorial expansion in 67, it really has become much smaller, the territory which is controlling. Um, the withdrawal from the Gaza Strip was kind of unique. And in a way, of course, it served to um, make the control of the West Bank more permanent. Um, nonetheless, um, if you look at Israel's internal debate, um, and if you look at the, the, the fears, even within the settler movement, um, this scenario of another withdrawal, maybe not a full withdrawal, but a partial withdrawal, is still very much present. Um, and so as long as this scenario can still be discussed, even if it's done within the political margins, um, Israel's control over the West Bank um, is not finalized. Um, and I'm not sure that Israel's... Um, increasing engagement with the Arab world 
um, could have come about if Israel actually had annexed parts of the West Bank. And mm -hmm. So I think there's an implicit deal that the world is deal the world is willing to deal with Israel as long as it's not annex at least not annexing the occupied territories. Um, right. Of course, under what conditions such a withdrawal might come about, we can't know. Yeah, so uh, let's move to the other side because you, you write about the uh, post-colonial states, about their expansion, about their contraction, but you write also about the reactions to these expansionist policies. And uh, in your book, you claim that the Palestinian uh, formed the counter identities to a great extent mirroring the, the Jewish narrative. Uh, so my question is, is it generally about the nationalist universal theme that we can see around the world among any other uh, national movements? Or you see a uh, direct influences from Zionists to the Palestinian national movement? Because, for example, if I read the Declaration of Independence of Israel, uh, 1948, and the one 40 years afterwards, the Palestinian one, I, I see very similar even sentences about the generations yearning for the land or the dialogue about the international legitimacy with dealing with the UN resolution of 1947 and both the declaration. So you see a direct influence or a general universal rule for the nationalist movements? I think there's a direct influence. Um, and this kind of historical learning has always gone both ways, right? If you look at this process of Zionist self-indigenization um, in Ottoman Palestine and then in Mandatory Palestine, they're looking at the Palestinians that surround them, yeah, in terms of language, in terms of cuisine, in terms of dress code, and they try to emulate this, yeah, as a way of becoming close to the land. Um, and of course, for the Palestinian experience, um, learning from Zionism as the political enemy um, always has made a lot of sense, right? First of all, the contacts were very close. Um, a lot of Palestinian intellectuals um, either were born in Israel. Um, or have studied Zionist and Jewish history. Um, and in a way, the parallels you mentioned um, are also historical parallels, right? So you have kind of, in the Palestinian case, this dispersed population, this stateless diaspora, recovering from a recent catastrophic event, seeking liberation within a nation state. And I think it's kind of obvious that you try to learn from your political enemy. Mm. Right, and, and staying with the uh, Palestinian environment, uh, you write about the, the Oslo process, about the Oslo Accords, and how they turned out to petrify Israeli occupation, uh, though perhaps they, they weren't supposed to, if we read them uh, literally. Uh, so you say about the Palestinian satellite state, the Palestinian Authority, which assists Israelis in controlling policing the West Bank and Gaza, to the, 2005 uh, until the disengagement. So comparing to the other national movements that you studied, do you see more successful policies that PLO might have adopted to advance the goals, the national goal, the Palestinian statehood? Let me start by the element of outsourcing. Um, I think one of kind of the major institutional changes um, that the first Intifada brings is really, it's, it's making Israel's rule very expensive, both in terms of kind of economic resources, but also in terms of um, international attention. Um, and this outsourcing of the occupation goes into two directions, right? It's outsourcing um, the administration of the Palestinian population to the Palestinian Authority as a satellite state, as you said, but it's also a form of outsourcing to international donors, right? So all these Palestinian NGOs, which get their funding from the EU, you hear this Israeli accusation that somehow it's undermining Israel, but if you ask me, it's another way of outsourcing um, the occupation in this way to EU donors. Um, when it comes to the question of the relative success of the Palestinian national movement, I mean, in a way, the Palestinians have tried the entire spectrum, the entire repertoire um, of nationalist movements, right? So they've tried guerrilla warfare, they've tried terrorism, um, they've tried transnational campaigns um, of delegitimization, this whole BDS thing. Um, and today, after over 50 years of occupation, kind of Israel is still in the occupied territories, still building settlements, 
um, enjoying great ties to the Western world, um, enjoying improving ties um, to the Arab world. So from a Palestinian perspective, um, I'm sure this must be terribly frustrating. Okay. Mm. And uh, I would like to uh, discuss some more your, your framework of the Middle East studies and state of Israel as part of the uh, Middle East. So you, we, we've covered the depiction of the Israel foreign policies that probably uh, resemble more of the Middle Eastern ways of uh, dealing with the international apartments. But do you see it manifesting also in the internal field, in the other traits of the Israeli state, or just the state expansion and dealing with the Palestinian issue? I think there's a number of shared elements. Um, if you look at Israel from a kind of a regional Middle Eastern perspective, um, first of all, it's, it's kind of legal legacies, right? So Ottoman law still being applied, um, British laws of emergency still being applied. Um, it um, is definitely relevant when, if you look at this huge security apparatus, right? So in the Arab world, you would say, well, it's a Muhabarat state. Um, but if you look at the way that Israel is running the West Bank, maybe Israel has its own tiny Muhabarat state, at least in the West Bank, um, and maybe inside Israel proper. Um, the fusion of um, religion and nationalism, I think that's fairly typical um, for, for the broader region of the Middle East. Um, even if you look at contemporary Israeli popular culture, um, my impression is that this huge wave of Middle Eastern Jews into Israel really has changed something that started out very much as a European Jewish project um, into something more hybrid. Yeah whether you want to call it um, a process of hybridization or creolization, if you just look at contemporary Israeli popular culture, whether it's Israeli cuisine, Israeli music, Israeli cinema, um, at least I don't have the impression um, that this is kind of um, this, this Western island in the jungle. Um, but my impression is that it's um, a national culture that is in an increasingly close dialogue with its neighbors. Um, so I think if we want to explore Israeli politics, but also Israeli culture and society, um, it makes a lot of sense to not just look at kind of the, the, the Jewish diasporic past um, or to Israel's links to the Western world, but at least to also look at this regional Middle Eastern dimension. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and, and you started this, this talk by saying about this uh, political scientists or historians trying to present Israel as a special case and uh, we are getting to the end of our discussion and we are getting back to this topic so maybe uh, because I would agree that it's sensible obviously to, to have this comparative approach and to show the regional perspective but maybe you have also something for them for the, the ones entertaining the Israel as a special case so do you think that the Israel there are some Israel policies or internal traits of the political system that strongly diverge from the regional patterns yeah absolutely I mean um, first of all um, clearly, if you look at this strong Western legacy, um, I think that might only be compared with the Turkish case, um, where you really have um, one or two generations that systematically try to build a modernized, westernized society, and then, then are struggling kind of with um, this rollback process or this counter-hegemonic project of looking more towards um, religious um, traditionalism. Um, if you think about the unique element of the Israeli case, um, I would argue what makes the Israeli or maybe the Israeli-Palestinian case um, so special is this economy of attention. Yeah? Everybody has heard about the conflict. Everybody pretends to be an expert. Um, everybody has strong opinions. Um, usually... Uh, quite polarizing, right? So people have strongly positive or strongly negative opinions um, about the state of Israel, of, which of course has a lot to do with Israel's being the only Jewish state. Um, I think that's what makes the conflict unique. Um, that's also what makes kind of the conflict unique for um, the Palestinians, right? Because Israel being always um, in the limelight of international attention um, always has given them access to world politics, 
to the global stage. Um, and there's a reason why we're so intimately familiar with the history of the Israeli occupation, um, but nobody knows or cares about Western Sahara. Yeah. Okay, so we are finishing on a sad note, but I want to uh, really, really strongly uh, thank you for uh, being here with us, for accepting our invitation uh, for this discussion. It was a fascinating one, and I would like to once again recommend your book, The Land Beyond the Border, the State Formation and Territorial Expansion in Syria, Morocco and Israel. And maybe our viewers are also interested in the two other case studies that we didn't cover uh, in details. So it's another reason to, to get into your book, and I strongly recommend it. So once again, it was an honor, a pleasure. Thank you very much, Professor Becker. Many thanks for this invitation. Um, and for the entertaining questions. Very helpful for myself to actually reread the book through your eyes. Very nice to hear you. Thank you and thank you all the viewers and perhaps let's see in the future.